Amen. Come on, clap hands, give God the praise and give God the glory right there. If you stand with me quickly, I want to jump right into the Word of God. I want to we're going to finish our series on the shift today. I'm going to be looking at the Gospel of St. Luke chapter 1. We've been preaching on the summer shift for June, July, and August, and we're concluding that today, that series of messages. I want to look at one passage quickly just to get and uh, establish how the message that God has given me for this summer shift series, the shift. Luke 1, 67 reads this way, and his father Zacharias was filled with with the Holy Ghost and prophesied saying blessed be the Lord God of Israel for he hath visited and redeemed his people let me read that again verse 67 says and his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost somebody said and he prophesied somebody said saying he prophesied saying I want to talk today from this thought I'm getting my voice back Come on, say, tell somebody, I'm getting my voice back. I'm getting, I'm getting my voice back. My voice is shifting back. I'm getting my voice back. A um, little while ago, I was having some vocal challenges. And my primary care doctor decided that I would go to see what's called an ENT. An ear, nose, and throat specialist. The ENT does a wonderful job in checking out the vocal cords, checking out the ear, checking out the nose to see if everything is functioning properly. And I was blessed to see an ENT who shared some things with me that I had never quite seen before. Fortunately for me, this ENT recognized who I was and when I arrived, he said, I want you to know that I've been praying for you. I'm a man of faith and I've been praying for your voice. It was interesting because we didn't share the same race or ethnicity. He was a specialist, but he said he knew me and he had been praying for me. It, it was amazing that to have a doctor who loves God there's nothing like having a praying doctor and he said to me before the exam got started would you mind if I pray for you I said sir I don't mind if you pray for me and he said something that intrigued me he said I want I want to pray for you because what I wanted to share with you I was praying that God would have you to connect with me I said why well, he said because what I want you to understand is preachers singers coaches he says, but especially African-American preachers, I've, I've listened to you preach. He said, what I want you to know is this, every time you preach, you are literally committing vocal violence. He says, the human voice was not made to do what some of you African-American preachers do. He said, I don't understand it, but I've studied it. That's something that we don't understand. How can you do that? How can you do? He said, I don't understand it. He says, he says, but then God gave me a revelation. This is what the doctor told me. He said, the reason why you're committing vocal violence is because coaches, you ever heard a coach that talk there? They're, they're very hoarse because the voice, the vocal cords were not made to withstand that type of pressure. Even if you use the diaphragm. He said, and what I understood is this. He said, every time you open your mouth, there's a war going on. He said, it's a war within your vocal cords. But he blew me away. He says, but it's also a, a, a war in the spirit realm. He said, because the job of the enemy is to take your voice. He said, what you got to understand is this. I'm praying for you because faith comes by hearing. And if God uses your voice to proclaim his word, that means that God is using you to build somebody's faith. And so if you're wondering why your voice is challenged, it's challenged because before you stand, the devil has already decided that he's going to do whatever he can to take your voice. And some of you think this is just homiletical for a preacher. 
But I stopped by this morning to tell you that such is also the case with you as a child of God. Here's why. Because you can't even be saved without your voice. Paul says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth and shalt believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Which means if the enemy can take your voice, he similarly can prevent you from even walking in your salvation. It, it, it went a step further. He said there's several things that can cause you to have voice trouble. He said sometimes it can be acid reflux. It can be a vocal nodule. It can be a polyp. It can be a cyst. He says, but that's something else I want you to understand that can cause you to have voice problems. He says it's called psychogenic aphonia. Psychogenic aphonia. I said, what is that? He says, you can be going through issues psychologically and in your emotions. And the things you're dealing with psychologically and emotionally can have an effect on your voice when nothing is wrong with the structure of your vocal cords. He says, the enemy and life seeks to stretch you out so much so that stress can take your voice. And I don't know who I'm talking to today, but you can be speaking words, but still have no voice. You can have the ability of articulation and communication, but have no voice. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is God uses a sound. Often your deliverance and your victory is based on the sound and the power. Do you know the Bible says that death and life are in the power of the tongue, your words. And so if your words are constricted and contaminated, it can prevent you from walking in victory. And the truth of the matter is this is what happens at the time of our text. God has called the Jew, a Jewish priest by the name of Zacharias, to be one of the persons who would minister to people in the temple during the first century world. And what happens, brothers and sisters, Zacharias, who is a God-fearing man who loved God, get this, ends up with being a preacher with no voice. What happens when the preacher is trying to minister but has no voice? What happens when you have the ability to have words but yet there's no power in your words? And what I've understood is some of us have voice but you have no voice because you're using the voice for the wrong purposes. As a matter of fact, what I discovered here is he said, if you don't understand what's really going on with your mouth, do you understand that there's power in your mouth? I said, well, doctor, tell me, what are some reasons why we can lose our voice? He says, here's, why the, here's, here's some reasons why the voice is lost. Here's, here, here's some reasons why the voice is lost. Here's some reasons why the voice is lost. He said, uh, in the case of Zacharias, because he wrongly used his voice. Somebody say he wrongly used his voice. Zacharias has a wife whose name is Elizabeth. And the Bible tells us they're well stricken in years. And God had not yet blessed Elizabeth's womb to give forth a child. So she's dealing with an issue of infertility. In the first century world, when a woman was infertile, it was seen as a curse by God. As if her curse was barrenness. You know, it's sad today that there are a lot of people who even in the 21st century, a lot of women and couples who even in our church who deal with issues of infertility. And one of the things that the enemy tries to do to women who are infertile or couples who are infertile is to make them think, well, what did I do wrong? A am I not good enough? And sometimes uh, infertility has nothing to do with the first century thought that you're getting paid back punishment from your sin. Please stop taking the burden of condemnation and guilt and trying to assign a cause unnecessarily to issues of infertility. Zacharias and Elizabeth have had no child, but God sends the angel Gabriel, the word angel, to say to Zacharias, look what he says to Zacharias, it blessed my entire life. He says to Zacharias verse, around verse 11 and 12, fear not, 
He says, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. He says, and God has sent me to tell you that your wife Elizabeth shall bear a son, even in your old age. God has sent me to tell you that you shall bear a son and you're going to call his name John. But notice how Zacharias uses his voice wrongly. He says, listen, you're going to have a, a son. He's going to bring joy and gladness. He's going to be great in the sight of the Lord. He's not going to have wine or strong drink. He shall be filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. He said he's going to be used as a vessel of the glory of God. But look what Zechari how Zechariah responds in verse 18. Look how he uses his voice. Zechariah said unto the angel, whereby shall I know this? For I'm an old man well stricken in years. He said, here is your problem, Zechariah. God sent your word through Gabriel. And God is telling you that you're getting ready to have a child. That he's going to be great. He's going to be the forerunner. He's going to be called John the Baptist. He's going to prepare the way for the Lord Jesus. And here's the problem. As, as soon as Zacharias gets the word from God through the angel Gabriel, his first response with his voice is, I don't understand. His first response is, how is this going to happen? And what the Holy Spirit sent me to tell all of us is just like a preacher or a coach can wrongly use their voice by going too high or too loud and not using the diaphragm. You and I can wrongly use our voice and it has nothing to do with intensity. It has nothing to do with how voluminous it is. It has nothing to do with the key or the regularity or the strength or the length at which you've used your voice. Many of us lose our voice every day. Here's how we lose our voice. We lose it because we wrongly use it. I say what it would mean. He says, because when God sends you a word of confirmation, when God confirms something in your spirit, the first thing you should do, your response should not be how. You don't use your voice to question how God is going to do it. When God sends you a word, your answer should not be whereby or how or when or what or through whom. Your answer is not how or whereby. When God speaks something to your spirit, the first thing you should use your voice for is to say this. Yes. Uh, you, 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 yes, Lord. I said the first thing that you should use your voice for when God sends you a word is not how, when, why, through whom, or whereby, or therefore, or wherefore. The first word you should utter is yes. Okay, you missed your shout. Vashon Mitchell and the praise team were just ministering about you going to see the goodness while you yet live. And some of you have not appropriately responded to that yet because all you see is badness and sadness. But I wish I had somebody right now who used your voice to say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, some things are going to be good in my finances. Yes, Lord, some things are turning around in my academics. Yes, Lord, some things are going to happen in my business, on my job, in my health, within my family, within my relationship, within my psychology, within my mind. Can you open your mouth right there and say, yes, Lord? As a matter of fact, God, I don't need to know how. I don't need to know when. I don't need to know through whom. Any way you bless me, Lord, I'll be. Am I talking to somebody who can open your mouth and say, God won't say yes? He says, he says, he said, you, you lost your voice because you, you, you've only used your voice. That's 1A. You've lost your voice, uh, 1B, because your words were not undergirded by victory. Your words weren't undergirded by victory. Here's what got me, family. Here's what really got me. Here's what really got me. The first thing the angel says to Zechariah, he says, Zechariah, fear not. I see you're fearful. Fear, for, fear not. He says, fear not. Fear not. Fear not. He says, I don't want you to fear. Here's why. Because your prayer has been heard. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, Zechariah, okay. I'm not showing up arbitrarily. I'm not showing up here 
by coincidence. I didn't flip through my roller decks and just say, I'm going to see Zacharias today. You weren't chosen because of lottery. Zacharias, the reason why God sent me here is because you have been praying for this. I have come in response to your prayers. I am part of the answer to what you've been praying. I've come to give you instruction and revelation and insight about what you've been praying for. And yet, when I show up, your response is to tell me how old you are. As if God doesn't know what your deficiencies are. How do you and I get the audacity and the unmitigated gall to tell God about our weaknesses, our idiosyncrasies, our mistakes, our past, our concerns? God, you can't use me because I'm a woman. That's real bright. You just told God what you are like God didn't know. God, you can't use me because I sinned in my past. That's real smart, Sherlock, as if God didn't know you were going to be a sinner. Everything about your life and my life, past, present, and future, God already knows it. But in spite of that, he chose to call you. He chose to use you. He chose to ordain you. He chose to elevate you. So don't you say to God, God, this is who I am. You ought to say, you know what? You know why I got this? job not how because I've been praying for it every time I pray for something you ought believe what you be if you're not gonna believe what you're praying for stop praying and am I talking to somebody who's been praying for God to do some things in your life and they've not yet manifested I wish you lift your hand and say God I receive it it may not come into October but my response is yes Lord if you're gonna worry about it don't pray if you're gonna pray about it don't worry. Ask and it shall be given. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and does anybody believe that prayer still changes things? Don't allow negativity. Don't allow what you've not yet seen manifest to make you think God can't do it. The problem with Zechariah is because it had taken so long. Obviously, he thought God had forgotten about him. He used his voice wrongly. You know why? Because he didn't even believe what he was preaching about. What do you mean by that, dude? Well, Zacharias is a Jewish priest. As a Jew, He's a descendant of Abraham. Before Christ's death, when Jews passed, they believed that their souls went to the spirit, to the bosom of Abraham. Here's what I want to tell you. Abraham is called the father of the faithful. Abraham is a progenitor of Hebrew faith. Abraham, his story is only his story because he and his wife, Sarah. Y'all quiet on me here. Were also barren. At 75, God told him to leave the earth of the Chaldees and go to a land I'm going to show you. He said, I'm going to make your name great. In thee and all families of the earth be blessed. I'm going to multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. I'm going to give you the land to inherit forever. Now he's 90 years of age and God has not yet blessed he and his wife with a child. He gets 100. He and Sarah still have not had a child through Sarah's womb. But at 100, when Sarah was 90, God gives her womb strength to conceive seed and she brings forth the son nine months later and calls him Isaac. And then God calls him from Abram to Abraham, the father of many nations. Zacharias, you a Jew. You a Jewish preacher. You a descendant of Abraham. You should know by experience and what you read in the Torah, in the Pentateuch, that you're not the first old man and old woman who didn't have a child. Y'all quiet on me here. The very father of Hebrew faith, you should have said as a preacher, not how you're going to do it, God. But what your response, should, what your voice should have been was this, God, if you did it for Abraham, 
and Sarah. You can do it for Zacharias and Elizabeth. You know why? Because God is no respecter of persons. Here's what the old folk was saying. It ain't no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do the same thing for you. This is why you never have to be jealous when God blesses your neighbor. If God gives your neighbor a brand new BMW, don't hate, don't get jealous, don't get envious, don't get covetous. Just celebrate because it means he's in the neighborhood. And if God has blessed you, am I talking to somebody around this house who believes that if he did it before, he'll do it again. He's the God of miracles, signs, wonders. He'll still take two fish and five loaves and feed the multitude. He'll still speak peace to your storm. He'll still dry your tears. He can still raise the dead. If you believe you're going to use your voice, say, God, do it again. Let me tell you how powerful words are. I like poetry, I like imagery. And, and often when I preach, I try to paint a picture. That's what they taught us in school, paint a picture so people can see it. And sometimes when I preach because I like poetry, I try to paint a picture and I say things like this. When God wanted light, he lit the sun one time and it's never gone out. Or never been to a repair shop. When God wanted somebody to work the lunar system of the night, he put bulbs in the stars. And I've called them to twinkle for beans of years. You heard me say stuff like that before. He's trying to paint a picture. How God put the wetness in the water, the whiteness in the snow, the viscosity in the oil. How God allowed the sweetness to be in the orange, the sour in the lemon. Y'all not helping me here. How God gave the dog the woof woof, the cat the meow, and the hyena its laugh. A lot, lot of imagery, right? But can I tell you, imagery, poetry, beautiful. Theology, pitiful. When God wanted a son, he didn't like the son once. He didn't put bulbs in the stars and call them the twinkle of a billion of years. When God wanted light, he stepped out in the darkness, opened his mouth and said, let that, y'all got the break some, let there be light. And ever since he spoke it, light has appeared. I dare you to go into your house and say, let there be surplus. Let there be increase. Let there be overflow. Let there be peace. Let there be healing. Open your mouth and say, let there be. While you open your mouth right now, God is working on somebody's life. While you're working right now, while you're speaking right now, the atmosphere is coming into agreement with your words. Open your mouth and say, let that be. I'm gonna give you one more chance. Say, I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. The next time you're paying bills and you got more month left than you got money, say, let that be. The next time you have a husband who's acting crazy, lay hands on your husband and say, let that be healing. Let that be deliverance. Let that be responsibility. Let that be salvation. Ooh, I feel God. I feel... Mark chapter 5, there was a woman who the historian Flavius Josephus calls Veronica. She had an issue of blood for 12 long years, had spent all her money, had gone to the doctors, and instead of getting better, she got worse. She was not supposed to be around society because she had been bleeding for 12 years. But you know what she did? She said to herself, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. 
I shall be made whole. If you ain't got nobody around you to speak, speak over yourself. Come on, open your mouth and say, let that be. I shall be made whole. This is my day of deliverance. I need to hear somebody in the overflow. I need to hear somebody online. Open your mouth and shout, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. That was, a, that was a man named Jairus. He was a ruler of the synagogue. His daughter was grievously ill. By the time Jesus was going to perform a miracle, one of the first things he said when he got there was, do me a favor, put everybody else out the room. Here's why. Because I'm going to speak something. But I need to get rid of all the negative Nancy and the doubting Danish. Get them away from me because I don't need negativity when I'm trying to speak life. That's part of our problem. We speak too much negativity. I am blessed. I am the head. I am not the tail. I am the lender and not the borrower. I am blessed in the city. I am blessed in the fields. I am blessed when I go. I am blessed when I come. I am a child of God. Let me hurry. Let me. Your words got power. You don't understand that. That's why the devil wants to make sure that's warfare. Every time you speak, there's a war going in your vocal cords. Ooh, I feel God. Now I understand why I've been having voice problems. Stress, pressure will cause a war in your mind and your words respond according to the stress. Thank God for the revelation. Paul said, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but, my, but mighty through God to the pulling down of, use your words. First Samuel 30, David and his men after getting back from the camp, discovered that the Malachites had invaded the south, took their wives and children captive, burned the city, and David cried. First Samuel 30 and 4 said, till you had no more power to cry. And his own 600 men turned on him and got ready to stone him. David never says, take me on vacation. He never said, take me to happy hour. He never said, bring me some cannabis. But when David's men got ready to stone and kill him, 1 Samuel 36 says, but David encouraged. He started having a survival monologue. I shall win. I shall live. I won't die. I will declare the works of the Lord. I will see the goodness in the land of the living. Open your mouth right now and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. That's the reason why he lost his voice. Let me move quick, but that, that, that's a remedy. That's a remedy. So you know what God said to him? Said, God said through, through the angel, said, 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 Gabriel said, I tell you what, Zacharias, since you're asking all these questions, since you're stuck with negativity, God sent me to give you spiritual laryngitis. You're going to be old and not able to speak 
until this thing is performed. So you know what God did to Gabriel? He gave him punishment. And the punishment was for nine months. Zacharias couldn't speak. God says, I'm going to shut your mouth. And I had to ask the Holy Ghost a question. Why do you shut his mouth? And here's what the text told me. It says, because Elizabeth is already old. And now she's getting ready to be old and pregnant. And an old pregnant woman doesn't need to be surrounded by anything that's not positive. So, it, so in order to keep Elizabeth from miscarrying what she's carrying, I'll shut your mouth just to ensure what I placed in Elizabeth comes to pass. You know what God told me to tell you? Thank God for the folk he took out of your life. Some of you have been complaining about why they won't return your call, why they won't respond to your email, why they're acting funny, why they block you on social media. The Holy Ghost told me to tell you he did it on purpose because you're pregnant with something. You're about to give birth to something and the people who you're surrounded with uh, were threats to what you're trying to deliver. And if I got to shut their mouth to shut their influence to take you to the next level, tell God, yes, Lord. Some people will stress you out so much with negativity, you can't go higher. Give God permission to silence and end whatever is not necessary for your next level. And you know what happens nine months later? Can I tell you what happened nine months later? Nine months later, Elizabeth gives birth to John. Now here's what messed me up. John is prophetically known as the voice crying out in the wilderness. Isn't it ironic that John is known by the thing his daddy lost? What I hear the Holy Ghost saying is, I'm getting ready to burst some voices in a new generation. Just because your parents didn't have it does not mean God won't manifest it in your life. Y'all quiet over here. As a matter of fact, I came to prophesy to somebody, you're going to be the first one in your, in your family to finish college. Okay, y'all not with me here. You're going to be the first one in your whole lineage, both sides, to have a successful business. As a matter of fact, I hear God saying, there are some first-time millionaires listening to this message right now. Just because it wasn't in a previous generation does not mean it can't happen in your generation. Say, I got my voice back. Open your mouth and say, I got my voice back. She gives birth to a voice, the thing her husband lost. And John comes out the womb, ah. Now here's what blessed me. God took Zechariah's voice, but it didn't take his hearing. I, I wish I had time to do it. Let me, let me, let me move on. And, and, and here's what happens. Here's what happened. Here's what happens. My God, here's what happened. What happened was, when she gives birth, this thing blessed me. Um, what happens is, some of her family members come around in verse 48 through 53. 
And uh, when you read the rest of the narrative, some of the family co members come around and, uh, and what they said was, uh, we're going to name him Zacharias Jr. Now, Gabriel had previously, to previously told John, had told Zacharias, his name is going to be John. But now, family members have come over for the baby shower. And when Elizabeth gives birth, they come in the room and the family decides his name is going to be Zacharias Jr. We're going to name him after his father. Come on. You know what's weird? How is it that people who haven't carried what you carry, who haven't endured, what you have to endure it. But they have the nerve, the audacity to speak and want to label what you carry. And she told them, no, his name is going to be John. Now here's what blessed me. Gabriel told Zacharias his name shall be John Zacharias was negative so God took his voice he hasn't spoken still hasn't spoken nine months later Elizabeth says no family he's not Zacharias Jr. his name is John how does she know what to call him when her husband didn't tell her and can't even speak? This is what I love about the Gospel of Luke because the Gospel of Luke goes against uh, uh, hetero patriarchal normatives. In other words, what I mean by that is that most of the first century gospels lift patriarchy. They lift men and reduce women. I love this text because Elizabeth doesn't need Zacharias to tell her what to name her baby. How do you know that? Because she had her own relationship with God. Scholars say just like God told Zacharias what to name uh, John, Spirit also told Elizabeth. Let me say to the single ladies in the house. It's all right to be cute. It's all right to go get you a man. But before you be cute and go get you a man, you better know how to hear from God. To have your own connection, your own relationship, your own sense of advocacy. Does anybody know God for yourself? I'm, I'm, I'm coming back. You, you, fellas, you need a woman. Every man needs him and Elizabeth. See, 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 young fellas, don't just want her cause she an IG model. Don't just be smitten because she can twerk. Too many of you are overtaken because she got Meg the Stallion knees. But what good is it to have Meg the Stallion knees? And you don't ever get on your knees and say, Father, I stretch my... It's all right to, to have a voice like Taylor Swift. But you need somebody who can swiftly go to God and pray when all hell is breaking loose in your life. Yeah. 
Yeah, she's beautiful, but can she pray for you when you can't pray? Yeah, she's fine, but she can't, can she handle business when you're incapacitated? Yeah, she's got beautiful teeth, but what happens when you die? And she's 65 and she lets Tyrone move in at, he's 30 and spend all the money that you spent. Oh, let me, let me, let me change the subject before it gets depressing up in this house. It's about to get depressing. Let me. You better have somebody who can talk to God on your behalf. Listen, do you have any prayer, prayer warriors, intercessors? You ought to give God praise for the people like Elizabeth who can hear from God when you can't. So, so her, her family says, no, we're going to call him Zacharias Jr. She said, no, his name going to be John. Do you know what they did next? They said, tell you what, we're going to go ask Zacharias. <laughs> Why is it that some of our family members don't know their place? <laughs> now, I let you come in the house. I extended the living room and the den and the kitchen to you. You got a bathroom you can use up front. Has a sink, some tissue. Why do you think you just can come in my house and take over and get into business that has nothing to do with you? You, you know what? You know my. You know what my, my my ENT told me. He said sometimes toxic environments can mess your voice up. Being around smoke being around a dry atmosphere sometimes you need a humidifier some of you got too many dry folk when they come in your life they dry up every moment and you're wondering why your voice is gone after dealing with them the woman who carried the baby they say we don't respect what you said so we're gonna go ask the man who can't talk. We would rather get directions from, from a mute than to get it from an anointed woman who just gave birth. Isn't that strange? How some folk right now don't believe what a woman says. But a run to get a word from a mute man. That's, that's, that's another sermon for another day. So now they start doing sign language. True stuff right in the Bible. They're doing sign language with Zacharias. What do you want to call him? It's right, it's right here in the text. It's right there in the text. Y'all laughing at me. It, it was a lady in Florida they hired to do sign language for the police department. Didn't know what she was doing. She was on the screen doing everything. And people, Y'all see that, that thing? And she was getting paid to do sign language. Lord, that was somebody of the aunties. I, that, that, that was somebody of the aunties. She doing, they, they're doing sign language. I'm finished with Zacharias. What do you want to call him? He said, I tell you what, bring me a sheet of paper and give me something to write with. And he wrote down the name John. He had to get a new language. Oh God, I wish I had time to deal with that. His deliverance came when he found a new language. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh God. I feel the Holy. When he found a new way to communicate. I ain't got time. That's a whole sermon by itself. And guess what happened? The moment he wrote the name John to agree with what had been said to him nine months earlier, guess what happened? His voice. The moment he agreed with Gabriel, God gave him his voice back. And the first thing he did, he prophesied. And said, blessed be the Lord. You know what he did? 
he started prophesying about the Redeemer. I researched that, and this will blew my mind. He started prophesying about Jesus and calls him my Redeemer. Here is the chronological quagmire. Jesus was still in Mary's belly. Elizabeth was six months older, six months uh, pregnant before Mary gets pregnant, which means when Mary gives birth at nine months, you have to subtract six from nine, which meant Mary was still three months pregnant. But Zacharias prophesied and said, verse 67, blessed, calls him our redeemer. He calls Jesus a redeemer and Jesus is not even born. He prophesies in the past tense about a child that was going to be born in the future tense. Now God moves him from priest to prophet. Since you missed the prophecy about John, don't miss the prophecy about Jesus. I'm finished. So he start talking about Jesus as if he was already here. He starts to praise the Lord for being his redeemer, even though Jesus was not yet born. I was trying to figure out how I was going to close this sermon. I didn't have no clothes for this sermon, y'all. Lord, what do I do to close this message? How, how do we celebrate something that hadn't happened yet? He's celebrating Jesus as a redeemer, but Mary was still pregnant with Jesus and wouldn't give birth to six months later. How are you calling him redeemer and he's still prenatally connected to his mama's umbilical cord? You're praising a redeemer who's not yet born in Bethlehem. How do you praise in advance six months before the redeemer is born? I was struggling, y'all. I had no clothes. And then God gave it to me yesterday. I close with this. A few years ago, as they were preparing for the 2020 Olympics, there was a young girl, I think from Texas, by the name of Shikari. Richardson. Everybody thought that she was going to compete against the Jamaicans as one of the fastest women in the world. Unfortunately, she said, pressure, I told you pressure can stress, uh, 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 led her to partake of some things that were forbidden by the Olympic Committee. And when they tested her, they found out she had cannabis in her system. And she was disqualified. And all over the world, people were lambasting her. They have no idea what she was carrying. I'm not making excuses for it, but be careful about uh, walking in somebody's shoes. Don't criticize somebody's steps if you ain't walked in their shoes. They lambasted her and called everything. But, I, but she says she took some time off to renew her faith, to do some inner work. And on last week, as she was competing, she drew a difficult lane assignment. They put her in lane nine, all the way on the end, and put the fast Jamaican women in the middle. And as the race started, even the announcers was talking about how fast the Jamaicans were. Because the first 50 meters, they took off first. But thank God, Shakara stayed in her own lane. Now, that ain't my shout. Here's my shout. When she got about 95 meters, she threw her hands up. Now, 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 here's what I want to tell you. Here's what I want to tell you. Here's what I want to tell you. The race, the race, the race, the race was not finished. You missed your shot. You can stop it now. I said the race 
was not finished. But she said, what I'm going to do is throw my hands up in advance. I'm going to shout before I get the victory. I don't have to see it to give God praise. I wish somebody around this house would throw your hands up and start praising God for the victory you got in that man. Do me a favor. Look at a neighbor. I'm throwing my hands up for my whole row. I'm throwing my hands up for your breakthrough. I'm throwing my hands up for your victory. As a matter of fact, I'm not gonna wait till the battle is over. I'm gonna shout. Do me a favor, just start clapping your hands for your role. If you're in overflow, clap your hands. If you're watching online, clap your hands. Start thanking God for the victory. Y'all give me five minutes, I'm gonna be out of here. I need somebody right now just to give God a victory dance. One, two, one, two, three, die! Everybody's standing. 